Thank you, Dr. Kumar. Now I invite Shumon Chakravarti for uh, the, as the last speaker, and then hope, thank you all for waiting, and please continue to uh, wait so we can take a few questions from you. Well, now that we have established that Maldives is a country, mm, believe you me, it's a very difficult task. And uh, it was a very difficult task when I first visited the country as a journalist in 2006. It was very easy here you know, because all of us seem to know about Maldives. So mm, it took me about five months to sell the story. Uh, it took me a lost baggage uh, to cover the nascent you know, democracy movement. Uh, Nasheed's uh, ambassador Sadeb is here mm, and he would bear me out because his dear friend, the man with whom he had that 21 hour call because he insists that it's 30 hour call always. So that call, that man called Zaki, uh, he enabled me to, you know, it's usually very humid and enabled me to buy a shirt because I had nothing absolutely uh, since uh, I went there. I was just carrying my laptop in my bag. So Molly is a difficult story to sell. And why I tell you this, I'll give you another small anecdote. Um, when I was dragged into doing this whole thing, you know, a digital platform, so I said, let's have footprints, you know, in our neighborhood, and let's do microsites on them. So I asked my team, uh, can we do uh, something called Focus Maldives because Nashi's thing was happening and all of that, and it all happened in the last one month. So my product manager, um, who is uh, who came and joined us from Tahilka, uh, he told me, uh, where should I look? I said, Indian Ocean. Uh, he said uh, left or right. So that's where we start with Maldives usually. So that's why I say that it's pretty easy here. Um, <coughs> Himal, there's a magazine quite respected uh, called Himal. It was actually relaunched in IIC about two or three years back in a different format. And uh, Himal, you know, their tagline is the South Asian magazine. Uh, so. I, uh, they usually have given me, just before the coup, they had given me a name in uh, Maldives because I'm known as the $800 million man uh, there because I broke the $800 million oil scam. And uh, so Himal, because I broke that story, Himal wanted me to write for them and that's where we actually started, uh, you know, they did their first ever cover on Maldives. Their first ever proper cover on Maldives. There was no cover on Maldives in you know in Himal before. We usually sell Maldives as the 100% Sunni Muslim nation, the most secular. Those days are gone. And uh, when people tell you uh, that, you know, uh, there are new uh, religious political parties and under Gayum they were in control, uh, please do not believe it. Because under Gayum it all started. What started under Gayum is a very interesting thing. Nobody looks, nobody looks beyond the cultured image, the crafted image that Gayum had for himself, a very suave man at that. Uh, he had this whole image going across the world and not just in India. And, uh, you know, he had this whole crafted image where he's known as the learned man. But where did he have his education? Nobody looks at that. Gayum studied in Egypt. He was the harbinger of all these radical forces who today are so active in the Maldives. It all happened under him when the democracy movement started. When the democracy movement started, that was one of Gayum's fallback option. All these kids that he used to send to the madrasas across the world with scholarships so liberally as Ambassador Sardeh was mentioning, all these were, some of them were brought back, some uh, were encouraged, uh, you know, to go and get more, uh, radical training, that's the time when he got the idea, he told people that there should be a religious party. That's the time Maldives started losing that secular tag. Now I'll tell you a fact which many people might not know about Maldives, I'm sure many of you might. But did you know when the first resorts were opened in 1977, 78? I think, you know, the year I was born, I think. So uh, those two resorts were, ma were owned by two of the most wealthiest families uh, in the Maldives. And uh, people used to travel there. The Westerners used to come there. 
they were beautiful, very eco-friendly, I want to tell you. And they were, all of them, both of them actually, were nude resorts. That is Maldives' beginning of the story of tourism. That is Maldives' beginning of, that's where the tag, you know, got along. I've spoken to many of my friends whose parents own those resorts or they work there and they have shared experiences with me, you know, what life used to be. So as I'm, what, I, what I'm trying to emphasize is the fact that today there is an Adalat party. There was no Adalat party. There was no religious party in the Maldives. And, you know, as strange as I, you know, it may seem because strange usually our political bedfellows, uh, Raghu spoke about the former defense minister, Nazim. Well, I remember in 2012, it was the same Nazim who was roaming around on the streets the day the coup happened. And I call it a coup. The day the coup happened, he was roaming around with a pistol in his hands. He was the one who were directing all the troops. He was the one who was captured on video, getting the police, getting the armed forces, driving them into the presidential palace. He was one of the prime movers. I don't have any sympathy for Nazim, but you know, many people have his differences with Yamin. Well, you know, the point I'm trying to make, the parliament today is a cabal. It's completely a cabal. A new oil scam is brewing. I'm telling you this. There is a new excess of evil, uh, evil which has happened in Maldives. And that excess is being given two main points are being run by Yamin and his tourism minister Adil that everybody knows. But what you don't know is what Gayum is doing behind the picture. Do we talk about Gayum anymore? Because we are concentrated on the regime. This regime, I completely agree, is more, you know, it's worse than Gayum can ever be. Yamin doesn't care for any crafted image, any, you know, any culture, anything. He is in your face. He will not care for anything. And that is what Yamin has always been. Every Maldivian you speak to, anybody who loves their democracy, they will tell you that Yamin is 200% more dangerous than Gayum ever was. Gayum finally had to give in to the democracy movement. But Yamin is not going to do that. Which brings me back to Yamin again, because what surprised me in 2012 when the coup happened was our former prime minister and his government, the UPA government, Manmohan Singh's reaction. Because I think uh, I had the privilege to do that story first. What exactly was Yamin doing when the coup happening, when the coup was happening in the Indian High Commission? What exactly were some <coughs> other members of their fraternity, that particular lot, that particular lobby doing in the Indian High Commission? What made Manmohan Singh declare the government of Wahid give him legitimacy on, I think, day one? Uh, I have still not figured out, but what I have figured out possibly is the fact that there were some behind, uh, behind the counter dealings. There was something to do about uh, not just resorts, but in this case, about us, you know, about who the airport duty-free contract should go to. Was it would, should it have been GMR or was it another Indian company? That's where the conflict lies. That's what happened. But then I blame it all as Ambassador Sadev said, Nasheed was too much of a democrat. I blame it all on Nasheed. I call him Anni. Uh, when he uh, came to power and Ambassador Sadev will bear me out and he says it right when he says that it's so difficult for the Indian government never used to you know, they were so afraid of meeting the Maldivian opposition. Maldives was sold to me by uh, Maria Didi, their first woman MP, as well as uh, somebody who, is better, who was a foreign minister later on, but better known as Ambassador Nassim uh, in the Maldives. Uh, usually they like coffee uh, in Maldives. I don't know why, but coffee is quite an addiction there. But, uh, you know, they sold me Maldives over a cup of tea at a press conference they came to do where only three journalists were present. So, and I had not gone even to do the story, I had gone to understand Maldives, what Maldives was all about. So, it's, I, I, I know exactly uh, the pains, the struggles that we had to do to make this opposition meet Indian leaders. Ambassador Sadev always took the lead, uh, he hosted them. But the fact always remained, even after Nasheed came to power, what happened was people didn't realize what's happening. What's happening in Maldives, what's 
what is going to happen in Maldives that Gayoom actually never went out of power and I think somebody pointed that out that Gayoom never went out of power because the judiciary was in his hand and what is the judiciary in Maldives I mean if somebody wants to talk about judiciary let's do dialogue with them what do who do you do dialogue with you dialogue you do dialogue with a judi with the chief justice who barely passed his class five you do dialogue with uh, a judge who is who was caught on camera having you know doing interesting things uh, do you do dialogue with a judge who is an who is accused of pedophilia do you do dialogue with a judge who uh, who was I think uh, you know asking a five-year-old 15 year old or five year old victim of sexual assault asking her to demonstrate what happened with her in court there is no judiciary in the Maldives. Let's 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 get the basics right about Maldives. There is no way you can do any, you know. The, some somebody spoke about consensus building. I don't agree. There is there there has to be one consensus in the Maldives, and the consensus is either you have Nasheed there, either you have, don't bring Nasheed. Get democracy in Maldives because if democracy is not there in Maldives, nothing is ever going to happen there. There is a set of people who is going to shout, a set of people, as you pointed out, it's a grassroots movement, that's a great thing. The grassroots movement is keeping the democracy, the flames of democracy alive, but how long will they be able to sustain it? That's the biggest question we face today. Do we face any other question? No. I think for all countries, we need to, you know, we need to uh, understand that there is no space for consensus building anymore. That space is gone. What we need now is... You know something which our present prime minister says that uh, that that we need to actually proactively look at our neighbors because the road to democracy in Maldives was painful. But as as you know, uh, Anni's brother Nazim, his uh, younger brother, he told me the demise of democracy can also be very quick, and it has happened. He told me that uh, you know just during when the coup was happening, and it has exactly happened. But why India? I mean, what, what, why, why in India do we talk about Maldives? What's the need for talking about Maldives? Because Maldives needs a voice. Because the Maldivians is often isolated from the mainstream. Because I'm a journalist, so I say mainstream of journalism and our thought process as much as it's isolated in the Indian Ocean. Because Maldives needs its space in history as well as geography. And we haven't given Maldives that till now. And, you know, there were a lot of expectations. Uh, I was speaking to Ambassador Sadeh before coming here. And there were a lot of expectations from a new regime. We have still not understood what, what is the problem because we lost the mango and the sack in 2012 in Maldives. Do we want to lose it all over again? Because they are looking, if one hope they are looking at, you know, is a hope of, you know, somewhere that New Delhi will act. There is a call for action. Maldivians are going out on the street. They have given the call for action. Somebody needs to back them up. And that's what big, if we call ourselves a democracy, that's a democracy in the neighborhood. And Maldives is exactly facing, as you pointed out, Niranjan, you know, in terms of the democracy crisis, is exactly facing what happened to Bangladesh in, you know, 1971. Then what happened to Sheikh Mujib, the army took over. It's difficult for the army to go back to the barracks. I understand all that. But having said that, what happened to Bangladesh in 2006, Maldives stands at that crossroad. This Bangladesh, as you know, I mean, there is no middle ground, right? I mean, there is either Bengali nationalism versus extremist radicalism. There is no middle ground. In Maldives, they also stand at a crossroad because at that time, the nationalists, the people who were secular, they were saying in Bangladesh at that time that it's a survival at stake. And somebody said very clearly that, you know, the survival of Maldives and the democracy and the concept of Maldives is at stake. That Maldives that we used to talk about in 2006, the most secular Sunni, 100% Sunni Muslim nation, nation, no longer there. And who is to blame for that? Because when Nasheed came to power, he gave the first interview which kind of, you know, kind of opened that Pandora's box. He gave an interview to me where he said for the first time that, yes, there are Maldivians who have gone to Afghanistan and they're participating uh, you know, they're participating, uh, they're, they're, they're basically fighting alongside the Taliban. Nobody in Maldives was willing to accept that. There was a man from Guantanamo Bay who was sent back from Guantanamo Bay. This man, I'm, I'm forgetting his name, his name is Sheikh something. And he was, uh, you know, he was roaming around. Gayoom actually allowed him to roam around the streets. Uh, 
what is interesting, what we need, because there is a sinister, there have always been this sinister geopolitical design when it comes to the Maldives, because Maldives is so, you know, so geopolitically strategic, and we have not been able to understand what Maldives is in terms of art from New Delhi's perspective as a geopolitical place. Forget from Maldives' perspective. For 30 years, India supported Gayum. Asia's, you know, he was Asia's longest ruling dictator, all that everybody knows. But, you know, when democracy came, which New Delhi backed actually after much reluctance, uh, you know, thanks to a lot of wrong assessments and a lot of wrong inputs which came under, it was Nasheed who allowed India to set up radars on 10 atolls of India. And I'm here talking from a very Indian perspective. Sure. So, uh, you know, let's, 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 I'll wrap up by saying this. We need some strong action in Maldives. We cannot allow Maldives to be treated as an Achilles knee and, you know, but, but it should be given its due respect in history and geography. And in this journey, I think India should not be shy to protect and cradle democracy and directly do it. The Maldivians would like that. For a tiny nation of about 400,000, I think, staying in an archipelago, it would be more momentous than anything that our aspiring superpower uh, can achieve ever. Thank you.